This is our student takeover we do every year. If you're new with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you've uh, been coming or maybe this is your first time and you've never filled out one of our connection cards, we have one in the seat right in front of you. Uh, You can fill that out, leave it in one of the boxes in the back. It's our chance to get to know you. But this is something that we do uh, once every year. Uh, that we put the student ministries kind of uh, right in front of the church and let you know a little bit about what we're all about. And we do this that that you might be encouraged and challenged and that you might uh, be thinking in your own spheres of influence who it is that you know that might need to be a part of something like this. Yesterday, uh, we were uh, working here uh, for the fall festival in downtown Plymouth and there was cars coming into our lot to park and we had high school students here working And there was a lady that pulled up and she said, I'm not parking, but she goes, I just wanted to ask some questions about the church. And, uh, and so Micah was there with me here, Micah was on the keys and, and, uh, she goes, uh, like, so what time are your services? And I said, well, you know, they're nine 30 and 11 o'clock. She's like, do you have a card? I was like, I I don't, but nine 30 and 11 every Sunday. And she goes, okay. So like tomorrow, nine 30 and 11. Yep. Yep. And she goes, and, and is the main pastor speaking tomorrow? And then Micah jumped in. He's like, no, it's our student takeover and the students are leading worship and testimony. It's going to be great and you should come. And she's like, will that be like for both the services? And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And she's like, well, will the main pastor be speaking? And so I just told her, I said, no, it's actually going to be our youth pastor. And I uh, said, you know, it's me. I said, no, it's actually our youth pastor. And she goes, what about next week? Uh, <laughs> So hopefully she comes back. Uh, but we, we think this is a pretty great uh, thing to be a part of and to uh, come before you and let you know a little bit about who we are. Our middle school ministry is called Ignite Student Ministries. And, and you'll see students around this building wearing shirts that say Ignite. And, and I love that name for our Ignite Ministries because for me, as a middle school student, is when I first uh, began to take hold of my faith and, and understand what it meant to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd always grown up knowing about God and going to church, but it was really those, those middle school years that were so formative in my life for me to uh, allow Christ and his spirit to dwell within me and go. And that's what we're looking to do with our middle school students. And every Wednesday night they come in and we, and we worship together and we open God's word and we go to camps and, and we have opportunities for students at the front end of their, their walk with Christ to go. In our high school ministry, we call Lighthouse Student Ministries. And and Lighthouse was a name given to the group by the students uh, a number of years ago, about, about nine years ago. Our students named the group Lighthouse. And it was, it was based on uh, the fact that high school is, is, those are some tough years. And, and I would say this, and I, I say this probably every year on this Sunday, I think that our high school students have it more difficult uh, than any generation before with the challenges and the temptations and the world that's around them, that this is... This is an unbelievable time to uh, have to try to live your life for Jesus in our current culture. And yet every week we're seeing students uh, come and and be a part and choose to take place. And I'll tell you this, if you haven't been around our student ministries, we're we're not very flashy. Uh, We're we're not very trendy. We kind of are who we are. We, We connect, we worship, we open God's word every single week. And yet we allow God to do the work to draw uh, those in who need to know him. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about what that looks like for us and and what we're we're trying to do with our students and how we're trying to have them take the word of God and take that out to the world. This uh, last uh, January, I told our students, I said, well, we're getting ready for for winter camp. But I said, I got to let you know that uh, as we go to winter camp, we have a limited amount of space. We, we can only take 74 students uh, because the facility we've been at for years uh, will only allow us to take 74 students. And so I said, so we're starting signups next Wednesday night and, and we're going to have to cut it off. And, and our first night of signups, we had 83 students that signed up to go to camp. And so we said, well, what are we supposed to do with that? So the next Wednesday, I let them know. I said, hey, I am actively trying to find a new facility because we're not going to fit where we were. And I don't want to tell people they can't go right from the start. And one of our students, Max, who's uh, graduated, he's like, you said you were going to cut it off. Just tell people they can't come. (laughs) That's our lead pastor, son. (laughs) I looked at Max and I said, you're not signed up. (laughs) 
He's like, well, you know I'm coming. Uh, I was like, that's not how it works. And so uh, we went and we found a new facility um, uh, that wasn't far away. And so we were trying to do some different things to, uh, to make our um, camp experience great. And one of the things we did is like, we, want, we said, we want to make this room our own. So I went on Amazon and I ordered these letters that spell Lighthouse. And those are up in our room now. If you've never been up to the student rooms, today's your day. Go up those stairs when you leave here and just go take a peek. If you've never gone up there, it's the best part of the whole building. Uh, every time people go up there, like, I had no idea this was here. Uh, but we, we got these letters from Amazon. They light up and they spell lighthouse. And we're like, this is great. So Scott Henderson, our middle school uh, director, came, uh, drove over to the camp to build these letters. They came in these uh, cardboard boxes from Amazon. So he got there ahead of the group and he was building the letters. And I got there and he was almost done. And he pulled out uh, one of the last letters. He's like, Jack, we have a problem. I was like, what's the matter, Scott? He said, we don't have an I. They sent us an A. Now, if you look at the lighthouse uh, word there, uh, you can see, because what I told him, I said, Scott, you need to make it an I. Uh, and so up close, you can see that that's, that's, that's not an, an I. Uh, that is, that is a, a poorly constructed A. Um, but when you back out, we can go back, back out to the picture again. Uh, when you see it, it looks like an eye, okay, from a distance. Like, hey, this is good. This, this works. And so we, we rolled with it, okay? And it was great all weekend. We kind of laughed about it. And so when I got back, and I knew we were going to take those letters, and we were going to put them up in our room, I went back on Amazon, and I said, hey, y'all sent me an A. Uh, so I, I sent back the pieces of the A uh, that we cut up, and they sent me an I, and I replaced it, and I put it up in our room, and our students complained. <laughs> I said, we want the A back. Uh, I said, no. Um, I said, this is, this is, it's supposed to be an I. And, and we talked about that even with our students is that, as I said, y'all, y'all don't, don't settle. Don't, don't settle for, for mediocrity when we can have greatness uh, of having the I uh, where it's supposed to be an I. And with our students, as, as much as I, I, I can joke about that and I'm like, uh, don't, don't live in that life of an A when we can be an I, uh, what we're doing on a weekly basis is challenging them to be who they are created to be and to do what they've been created to do. And when they can be who they're created to be and do what they're created to do, God will begin to use that to do a mighty work in their lives. And we've seen that time and time again in the lives of our students and the impact that they're having in this area. And I want you as a church, a Solid Rock Bible Church today, to walk away encouraged by what God is doing in this generation. And specifically what God is doing in the lives of the students here in our church. And I want you to see this ripple effect that's begun to take place. There's a story in the book of Matthew, and I say it's in the book of Matthew, but it's actually also in the book of Mark and Luke and John. There's only one story before the triumphal entry in the last week of Christ's life that's that's included in all four Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's the, it's the miracle where Jesus feeds the 5,000. And why is it that four different accounts of the life of Christ that all cover a variety of teachings and miracles and, and things that happen in the life of Christ, why is it that all four authors felt it important enough to include it in their gospel? I want you to see it, and I want you to see a couple of key words that are right in the middle that I think are so important in the lives of our students Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 14 says, Now when Jesus heard this, he he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. When the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. So it starts with Jesus seeing people. Now Jesus, fully God, but also fully man, had the needs of a man, uh, needed that time away, needed that space. Sometimes, some of y'all introverts, you understand. Sometimes you just need less people, okay? And this wasn't Jesus. I'm not saying Jesus was an introvert, but there was time he withdrew. But when he withdrew, the people just followed him. Instead of turning away, that Jesus said he had compassion on them, and he saw them, and he saw their need for him, and he had these disciples with them, that he was modeling what this care is to look like. And so he didn't turn them away. He began to teach, and he began to heal. 
In verse 15, it says this. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the day is now over and the crowds send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Now there's some of Jesus that's, that's passing off on his disciples because they see the people and they see the need. There is a need that the people have that needs to be met. And so they're encouraging Jesus to, to meet the needs of the people. They're going to be hungry, and probably some of the disciples are getting hungry. Uh, they're like, hey, send people into town so they can eat, and then they can come back. But, but like, take care of their needs, Jesus. And Jesus gives a phrase that we see again in all four accounts that I think is, is the most important part of this whole story. Uh, and I'll tell you the end of the story, because we're not going to even read it. They all eat. Everybody eats, and there's an overflow of food. We're not going to even get to that part. Jesus says to the disciples, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. There's a need that needs to be met in the lives of the people. The disciples recognize the need. They go to Jesus with the need, and Jesus answers the need by telling the disciples, take care of it. You give them something to eat. The biggest miracle uh, that we see, because it's in all four Gospels, Jesus feeding 5,000 and some, uh, some people will say it's up to 20,000 because it was just accounting for the men in the story. But the reality is he says, there's a lot of people here that need to eat. And Jesus said to the disciples, give them something to eat. Now in John's account, one of the disciples steps forward and said, hey, Jesus, it'll take like six months salary for each of these people to just have one bite of food. He's starting to think in an earthly sense, like, like, man, how can we take care of this on our own? And Jesus said, just take care of it. And so the disciples go out, and, and, and again, in John's account, Andrew comes back, and, and this is Andrew speaking in verse 17. It says, they said to him, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Now, this is, this is Jesus taking the work of the ministry and placing it in the hands of the disciples. And I love that. Because the disciples on their own have no power to make the change needed to affect the lives of all these people. But with Christ, they can. My man Nolan right here in front, uh, he had his last Wednesday, this past Wednesday, and I didn't know he was going to be sitting here, so it's great that he's here. And he came up to me at the end of the night and uh, got a big hug from him, and he said, he goes, Jack, you changed my life. He's heading to uh, University of Chicago in a couple weeks. And I told him, nope. I didn't change your life. Jesus changed your life. Like none of us have the power to change somebody's life. But Jesus does. The disciples on their own did not have the power to feed 20,000 people. But the disciples through Jesus did. And so he said, what do you have? And Andrew said, we, we have these, these five loaves and these two fish. And in fact, John's account said that they, they took from a boy. So they, they stole some kid's lunch. Uh, and they said, this is, this is what we have. We got this lunchable. Uh, like, what, what do you want to do with this, Jesus? Andrew says, this is not nearly enough. That's, again, the glory of Jesus. Because the disciples gave him everything they had. When you give Jesus your everything, he can do anything. And so they gave Jesus everything that they had. And then he fed the masses. And he fed the masses till there was an overflow of 12 baskets. And the disciples were the ones that had to keep coming back to Jesus. Okay, I need more. I need more. I need more. Until all the people were fed. And at the end, they could stop and say, look what Jesus did. Now, the moment the disciples said, hey, Jesus, these people need something to eat. Jesus could have just said, hey, sit down. I'll give them something to eat. He didn't. He said, you give them something to eat. He said, you be a part of the work that needs to be done here. And this is, this is the crux of what we're trying to do in our student ministries. We're trying to point our students to Jesus, to, to not just believe in Jesus, but then to be willing to be used by Jesus. 
and to trust that, that God's plan for their life is way bigger than their plan for their life. To trust that, that walking with God has benefits that will last in eternity. I was meeting with a student last week and we were talking because they're going through some serious struggles and we were talking about uh, prayer and, and he brought up that, you know, James says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective and my prayers aren't working. And I told him, I said, yeah, they are. Are you, are you continuing to pray? I'm continuing to pray. I said, you know, praying to God and a, from a righteous heart, it doesn't mean that you're going to get what you want. It means that you're going to love what God wants. Because your heart and God's heart are going to come together. My verses I bring up a lot, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you what you want. Why? Because what, what I want and what God want are the same. And what Jesus is trying to do with his disciples, these guys who've kind of been battling for position, battling for power, battling for so much, is saying, hey, I'm about to leave. This is the back end of Jesus' ministry. I'm about to leave, and when I leave, y'all need to give them something to eat. I, I, I hate this past uh, Wednesday night because this last Wednesday night was my last night with my 2024 grads, and over the last month we've been praying for them every week, and I, and I hate that. I hate, like, having them leave our ministry and sending them off to college and sending them off to the workforce. But they don't belong to us. <laughs> they don't belong to Lighthouse. They don't belong to Solid Rock. They belong to Jesus. And there's a time where we say, hey, you need to go. You need to go and start giving people something to eat. And we see it. We see it happen right away. And the story that you guys already, a verse you already have heard, Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, the last time Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Let me, let me uh, give you a different translation of Acts chapter 1, 8. He said, the Holy Spirit's coming. Now go give them something to eat. It's on you. And I'm, I'm always like, I'm always blown away. And I come back to the lives of the disciples time and time again, because I am, I, for me, it's an unbelievable thing that Jesus took everything he did and he left it in the hands of 11. But here's the reality. Y'all are sitting in here today because of those 11. You are part of that ripple effect. You are a part of what happened. You are a part of Acts chapter 1-8. Jesus saying, the Holy Spirit's coming. Now you need to go. Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. You need to start here. And you need to start spreading yourself out and letting people know that Jesus is God. In the very next chapter, Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches his first sermon. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 41. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who received his word were baptized. And there were added to that day about three thousand souls. Day one of the church. Jesus in front of the crowds, you give them something to eat. Jesus leaves. Hey, it's time to give them something to eat. Acts chapter 2, they give the people something to eat. And they respond. And the ripple keeps going. Friends, here's, here's what we can't be as the church. Uh, you know, a lot of us, we, we just want to come into church and be fed and be fed and be fed and be fed and be fed. And, and, and I understand that. I, I'd like to be fed, not just with 
the word of God, just with food. Uh, I, I, I like to be fed, okay? But hear this, the church isn't meant to be like some all-you-can-eat buffet where you just come and be fed and get full and go home and sleep. Uh, like this is supposed to be carry out. This is supposed to be take your food and go and give others something to eat. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility, an obligation a job description of being one that is going to help feed others. And for us as a church, that's why all these opportunities we have, like if you came in today and you're like, man, this music isn't for me. This is a little bit too chaotic. I understand. If you're like, this music is for me, we do this every Wednesday night. Talk to me. Come serve with us. Okay? We, we need people who are pouring in this generation to go out. We need people who are lining up to serve in our Awana ministries to teach kids uh, the word of God so they, they may take that word of God and give it to somebody else. We need men and women who are going to be committed to being a part of our, our Bible studies that we have here, not just so you can take in, but so then you can take what you've learned and give it away. And we're getting to see that. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. These are the final words of Paul. 2 Timothy is the last book that he wrote. Paul was influenced by those disciples at his conversion. Those disciples were influenced by Jesus, so there's a continuing ripple effect. Paul influences Timothy, a young pastor, and so he tells Timothy, this young pastor, follow the pattern and sound words that you have heard from me from the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard this good deposit entrusted to you. Guard this. Take this seriously. Paul, in his final words, is talking to a pastor that he loves. He's like, you need to take this and you need to take care of it. But here's the thing. When you guard something, we think of protecting it and hiding it. We don't, we don't guard the deposit of the word of God by hiding it. We guard it by sharing it. And friends, I I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that that we have been called to use the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of the kingdom of God. And every single person in this room who calls yourself a follower of Jesus, if Jesus was here standing beside you right now, he would say this to you, you give them something to eat. They went from Jesus to the disciples, to Paul, to Timothy, to the the 3,000 to us being in here right now. And where is it going to go from here? Back in 2020, uh, which was a fun year to do youth ministry. Um, no. Uh, it, there were so many things that we had to figure out as a church. But one of the things we started doing in the summer of 2020, as soon as that we felt like we had uh, the availability to do so, we, we started meeting with our student ministries our students kept coming out, and, and, and we were filling the lawn every, every week, and we were filling this building every week with students. And, and we, we had some people that, that called in to complain. We had some people that wrote in and emailed in and emailed the city and, and, and didn't like that there were so many students that were gathering on Wednesday nights. But I got a message on August 26, 2020, uh, from uh, Bethany Taylor, who I saw walk in. Uh, where's Bethany? She's back there. I got a message August 26th. I had to go back and look. Uh, 2020. Just came into our church Facebook account. She said, hey, she goes, can the youth pastor please contact me? Because uh, I saw all these people. And first one I was getting, can the youth pastor contact me? I was like, oh, shoot. Uh, but but this, she said, I saw all these people uh, and I just had some questions. I got a, a, a girl that's in high school and a girl going into middle school. And so I called her. Uh, She called me. I sent her my number. She called me that afternoon. And I can remember the conversation uh, so clearly. But she talked about her her girl, Elise, uh, who's also sitting right here. Uh, And she talked about that she was lacking a little bit in life, which is crazy for me to think about now that I know Elise. She was lacking a little bit in life. And she wasn't sure what was going on, but she needed something. And she goes, "Can, can I have them come out to your youth ministry? And I said, yeah. And there was this ripple effect that happened from there that I want you to see. Uh, can I have the, the choir and the band, can you guys come back up here real quick before I even start this video? That way we're not distracted by your guys' chaos, and we're going to talk about this in a sec. I want you to see the, uh, the ripple effect that came from a, a Facebook message in 
August of 2020. Watch this video. Hi, my name is Elise Taylor, and I ended up at Lighthouse because my sister and I had been doing theater next door, and uh, my mom noticed this big group of kids who were meeting on the lawn, even though, you know, it was in the middle of COVID, and she thought, I should check this out. Um, and so I ended up going there after my mom reached out to Jack, um, and that winter camp, the last night, I felt so holy and completely the presence of God just in me and around me for the first time, and it was a transformative moment, truly. Um, and, and since then, I've only gotten to see what what His presence can do, not only in my life, but in me being able to share it with all of my friends. And Hi, my name is Haley Mulvin, and I was invited by Elise about 3,000 billion times until I finally came. And in February, I gave my life to Jesus. Hey, y'all. I'm Jordan. I was invited out to Lighthouse by a former co-worker and now very good friend of mine, Elise. It took a couple times convincing me to come here, but eventually I came two years ago at one night and gave my life to Christ a year and a half later after egging and egging on by everyone around me, finally realizing that, oh, Christ needs to be in my life. I need him in my life. And I'm so thankful and so grateful. Not only was it at least inspirational to coming to my faith, but it domino affected onto my dad as well, who had been struggling since childhood to come to faith and accept Christ into his life. And then on Easter Sunday on this year, he felt the presence of God in his soul when he was worshiping during service. And he led him into his life, and it was one of the greatest moments of his life, he said. And then sadly, on July 20th, he passed. But the minute that he was about to pass, he had said he had accepted Christ into his life. Hi, my name is Nadia, and I was introduced to Lighthouse by Elise. Um, and the biggest impact that Lighthouse has had on my faith journey is that this past winter camp, I was able to see just how much God has been working in my life through so many of my friends making big steps in their faith journey and just teaching me how God moves in such mysterious ways. Um, my name is Nolan Johnson. Um, I was invited to Lighthouse by Nadia. Um, and a big moment of spiritual growth for me was two years ago on my first Detroit trip. We were worshiping on the steps of a big church in downtown Detroit. And I sung for the first time during worship and I kind of realized what had been missing in my life. Hi, my name is Henry Day. I was invited by Nolan. And a big moment for me was probably earlier this year at a winter camp. I, um, I gave my life to Christ uh, during the second night. And it really changed my life because I genuinely felt like I was filled with the Holy Spirit, which is an experience that I've never had before. Hello, my name is Brendan Colo, and I was invited to the youth group by these two guys. And one of my biggest spiritual growths while being here at youth group was after a Wednesday night, Steve, Her Steve Romano uh, helped me and showed me how to give up my life for Christ. And ever since that, I feel like I finally realized something I've been looking for in my life as a woman. Hi, my name is Charlie Day. I was invited out to Lighthouse by my brother, Henry Day. And the biggest thing that God's done through me, done for me throughout this group was on the same day as him, February 17th, I gave my life to Christ. It's the thing I needed for a very long time, and he works in such such perfect timing. So as you guys saw, a uh, very big family tree, and uh, pass, passing down pretty, pretty well, right? So he talked about this whole ripple effect, and how one person invites another, which it's, it's more than just inviting people. It's more than just wanting them to support you. It's more, than, it's more than that. It's wanting to help others who need help. I needed help. And when I gave my life, I found what I was missing. And it was really amazing. But because I wasn't, like, I didn't feel, like, 
sorry, <laughs> I didn't have this uh, help that I needed. I have a lot of friends who also need help. But I, like most of my friends, hit it. I was scared, I was lonely, and I needed something, and that something was Jesus. And as you can see, I haven't invited anybody yet. Well, I try, but <laughs> all I can do is invite. And like God said, uh, like Jack says, God's timing is perfect. And I can't control what, what the Holy Spirit wants to do with the people around me. But I can keep inviting people, and I would like to ask all of you to pray for not just me, but for everybody, that we can all invite people and have the Holy Spirit work in so many ways. Because so many kids are struggling, so many kids are scared and don't know what the world's about, and they need Jesus in their life. So I would ask all of you, please pray for us. That video isn't done. Like we should have ended it with to be continued. And it's in the lives of our students and in the lives of every person in our church. And so for me, I love being here. I love this Sunday because I love getting to worship with my friends here. But I love seeing them be the hands and feet of Jesus. So church, be encouraged. God is doing a mighty work in the lives of our students here. But pray. Pray as we go into battle that God would arm these men and women. He would protect them. He would lead them. He would direct them for his glory. And that we would be a part of feeding the people. Would you all stand and join us as we worship?